It is not possible to be part of a globally interconnected world without accepting our share of responsibility for the environment and for future generations. One way to take charge of environmental impact is by reducing dependency on traditional sources of energy and channeled mainly into the modernized generation of power. At Skoda Auto Volkswagen India, we are taking strides to implement simply clever solutions to minimize the impact that our operations have on the environment. As one of the world's fastest growing economies, we cannot afford to slow down. But that doesn't mean we cannot tap into an abundant and unlimited source to meet our needs. Green Future Factory is not just a fancy term for us. We are putting to use the available rooftop space for solar power generation. What you are seeing surrounding me is one of the biggest rooftop solar power plant, not only in the Volkswagen group, but any automobile industry in the world. We have installed 25,770 modules spread over rooftop area of 65,000 square meter. We are going to generate 12 million units against our requirement of 50 million units. The solar panels will provide the plant with a significant contribution to the total power requirement of 60 million kilowatt hour. Go to zero is the mission statement environment of Volkswagen Group and Skoda Auto. Under the green future strategy of Skoda Auto, decarbonization of our manufacturing plant is a key element. We are installing 8.5 megawatts of rooftop solar photovoltaics in Pune plant. This will save 900 tons of carbon dioxide every year and that is our bit for a greener planet. This will cater to 20% of our annual energy needs given we have some 300 days of sunshine. The energy generated on the roof will power operations of the plant. For example, the body shop, paint shop and the assembly shop. This green energy is good for the environment and cost effective in a joint initiative with Green Future, our endeavor is to attain 100% reliance on green energy. At Skoda Auto Volkswagen India, we are committed towards a better today and a greener tomorrow. Yeah. Namaskar to our friends of India. Good morning and guten Tag uh, nach Deutschland. Welcome to this uh, session on renewable energy power uh, supply for commercial and uh, industrial customers in India at the German Days Digital as organized by Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. Thanks to our Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in India, who has tasked us uh, uh, with uh, promoting these kind of uh, uh, new possibilities to get greener, to source green energy, thanks to our Ministry of uh, for Power in, in, in Germany, BMWI, uh, for uh, uh, tasking us uh, to promote renewable energy power supply for commercial and industrial customers in India. And we'll directly start uh, in the, with our session. What is this all about? We will about get to the Skoda factory. We are very excited. We saw the video already about what's possible. And I think a very interesting uh, detail about it is that uh, we are talking about the PPA model. It means uh, you do not have to uh, invest completely in the asset. Uh, you can also uh, do a power purchase agreement and just buy the power at a maybe a lower price than uh, you might pay uh, to the discom and most of all buying and purchasing green power um, just to get an idea on what we're talking about in india the market for photovoltaic rooftops uh, uh, as we will hear from sri vinay rushtagiji later from bridge to india uh, focuses or, or uh, concentrates on commercial and industrial 
potential is picking up, but uh, for certain reasons, such as the uh, higher power prices in the commercial uh, and industrial uh, sector, uh, definitely uh, this market segment uh, is uh, more interesting for replacing it by solar or even sourcing wind or uh, other um, uh, renewable energy power supply. Uh, what are we talking about? If we talk about solar, this is um, maybe an extreme case, but uh, if you live in certain states in India, it can happen that you pay up to 12 cents uh, per kilowatt hour as a uh, commercial customer, and uh, that might be an alternative to go, for example, for a, a solar rooftop, and in the best case, you're paying around 4.6 euro cent uh, per kilowatt hour. But that definitely is only the case if you also consume uh, all the power during weekends or if there is a heat in there. Uh, surplus PV generation can be sold at the grid at what price? That is the big question. Because if you cannot, then uh, uh, PV would be wasted, for example, during weekends and holidays. No? So you would need to. Uh, 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 optimize your system for self-consumption. But if you go for a PPA model, for example, as Skoda did, all these kinds of thoughts uh, you leave to the developer of the project. No? But uh, uh, yes, if you uh, have to waste the electricity and you cannot uh, inject it into the grid, uh, then definitely the uh, levelized cost of energy the, the, uh, or the price for you uh, uh, goes up. No? Um, uh, another possibility would maybe to put a battery system and then uh, increase the amount of uh, own electricity uh, consumed. Uh, to get an idea where this makes sense, here a map of uh, the uh, uh, states in India and their respective rates in the commercial uh, and industrial sector. So maybe in Gujarat, the prices for electricity for commercial and industrial, industrial customers are quite low. So you might um, have to find uh, a really good business model uh, uh, to invest. But there's a lot of states now where the industrial and uh, commercial tariffs are actually higher uh, than what it would cost to go by solar. So uh, definitely worth a thought. And uh, yeah, with this one, uh, I will just kickstart the session and we'll learn more about the motivation for consumption of, consumption of renewable power uh, Vinay Ushtagi, Managing Director from Bridge to India, is here with us. Welcome, uh, Vinay Ji. Uh, then Sanjay Kareji from uh, Skoda Auto Volkswagen India, who have done a remarkable job. Uh, just seeing the introductory video, uh, really amazed and uh, fascinated also uh, for what is still to come. Congratulations. And then we'll have with us Mr. Subramaniam uh, uh, from uh, Anna Park Energy Private Limited, a German developer and EPC, who has also a lot of experience in installing these kind of rooftops. And uh, with this, over to you, Vinayji, looking forward to, to your insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tobias. Uh, and thank you, uh, Indo-German Energy Forum, for inviting me. Uh, so I'll share my presentation now. Can you see the screen, Tobias? Yes, perfect. OK, good. Uh, so thank you, Tobias. Uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, all the participants. So as Tobias said, uh, I'm going to make a quick presentation on uh, what is the overall uh, uh, landscape for CNI consumers for procuring renewable power in India. Uh, and it is a very interesting uh, and thriving market uh, with many, many consumers keen on buying more renewable power for lots of different reasons. Uh, just a very, very quick introduction. Uh, so I'm from Bridge to India, which is uh, a clean energy focused uh, consulting company. Uh, now we also have, uh, we also issue a lot of research, uh, collect a lot of data on the rooftop solar and other uh, renewable power projects. Uh, a lot of that research is available on our website, uh, bridge to india.com. So please go there uh, and use that research. I think you will find it useful. Uh, so we work with all the stakeholders in the sector, uh, and we've been doing lots of work, uh, particularly in CNI renewables uh, in the last three to four years as this market is beginning to grow. Uh, and we are also beginning to now finally do a lot of work with consumers 
uh, advising them on project feasibility studies, business models, uh, policy landscape, and so on. So uh, just to kind of uh, give you the whole context, uh, you know, the total CNI power demand in India is about 80 gigawatts. And this demand is growing very roughly at about five to 6% per annum on an average. Now, wh what you can see is that uh, almost two thirds or more than two thirds of the total power is procured from uh, the discoms or the local uh, distribution companies uh, the utilities, which in India are organized as monopoly businesses. So these are companies who provide you power over the grid. And as a consumer, you don't have a choice of a monopoly. So, so you are stuck with a discom uh, in your region. Uh, and uh, like Tobias said, uh, the CNI tariffs uh, in India is being distribution company, uh, uh, provide cheap power to the residential and the agricultural consumers and uh, charge much higher tariffs to CNI consumers. So, which means that the CNI tariffs in India are actually some of the highest in the world uh, at about anything between eight to 10 uh, or 12 euro cents. And that is one of the major incentives for the consumers to look for alternative uh, sources of power. Uh, the other uh, main sources uh, you see on this slide are one is the power exchanges. Uh, and then the second is long-term open access. So these are, uh, off-site private uh, power projects, uh, wherein the larger consumers, consumers with a connected capacity load of more than one megawatt, they can buy power from any consumer, any uh, power generator anywhere in the country, uh, and you and wield that power over the grid. Of course, there are terms and conditions for for doing so, uh, but that is a route uh, also available to the CNI consumers. Uh, finally, uh, many of the larger consumers, uh, in particular, you know, companies like steel producers, petrochemical plants, cement plants, etc., they have a very large captive uh, thermal power plants. So that is a pretty substantial uh, procurement uh, source. And finally, rooftop solar, as you see at one percent in this slide, is also uh, beginning to grow. So the point is that uh, the options for uh, senior consumers to procure power in India are, I would say, somewhat limited in comparison to the other countries. Uh, there are no structures like virtual power purchase agreements, uh, which have become very popular in the US and Australia, et cetera, uh, being used right now. Uh, also, uh, you can only buy conventional power or the blended power or over the grid from the discounts. You don't have a choice of buying renewable power. So the only two choices for buying renewable power uh, for the CNI consumers are the long-term open access and rooftop solar. Uh, this Tobias uh, already mentioned, uh, this slide shows uh, grid tariffs, uh, the variable grid tariffs uh, in some of the major states uh, against uh, cost of rooftop solar power and the open access uh, solar power. And, and as you can see, uh, there are uh, very substantial savings to be made and that is one of the major uh, growth drivers uh, for the CNI renewable market. Now, uh, looking at the drivers, so the number one driver is the financial savings, uh, but equally we see very strong driver emerging in the form of internal uh, mandates uh, from companies and their investors who are increasingly saying that they want to decarbonize and reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, many companies are saying that they want to adopt 100% uh, renewables by a certain date, uh, between, usually between 2025 and 2030. Uh, so they want to buy much more renewable power. And then the government has mandated uh, some of the larger consumers uh, to procure a fixed percentage of the total power need uh, in the form of renewable power purchase obligation uh, from renewable sources. And that uh, RPO uh, target, it varies from state to state. Uh, very broadly speaking, that is uh, it very usually uh, at present, it is about uh, anything between 10 to 15% uh, across the country. Now, as against this, uh, the choice is available to the CNI consumers for buying renewable power, one rooftop solar uh, and second open access solar and wind. Uh, there is a new window which has opened recently, just one month ago, uh, Indian regulator has allowed uh, renewable power to start trading on the exchanges. So still very new, very, very early days. Uh, we see some challenges in the way uh, the trading windows uh, are structured. Uh, and the kind of uh, pretty onerous forecasting and scheduling requirements. But we do believe that over a period of time, there will be more flexibility in this window and which will provide another 
uh, avenue for the consumers. Uh, finally, uh, there is something called renewable energy certificates in India. Uh, these are certificates uh, issued to uh, RE power generators. Uh, so the consumers can buy these certificates. if They're not able to consume direct RE power. But the problem is that uh, the supply of these certificates is very limited uh, and the price uh, prices are very high. So many consumers are not keen on this option anymore. Uh, so coming to the two main options, uh, rooftop solar and open access are both, as you can see from this slide, uh, you know, they've been growing very rapidly up until last year. Uh, last one year or about 18 months, we've seen some challenges uh, because of one, uh, solar import duties being imposed by the government, uh, and two, uh, some of the uh, uh, policies and procedures and on connection to the grid uh, being changed in some of the states. So there has been a little bit of uncertainty over the last uh, 18 months or so, but we do believe that this is a temporary trend, uh, part of the kind of growth phase of this market. Uh, and uh, we strongly believe that there's a very huge uh, growth potential given how rapidly the consumers want to decarbonize. Uh, a quick comparison uh, between these two uh, main options. Uh, rooftop solar is typically constrained by the amount of space that is available within the premises. Uh, typically, most consumers can only buy about 10 to 15% uh, of the power from rooftop solar. Open access, in contrast, is virtually unlimited. Uh, in rooftop solar, the main risk is obviously you are implementing, installing a plant on the, on the roof which may or may not be structurally sound. Uh, but in open access, while you don't have the roofing issues, uh, the issues are, uh, you know, the developers need to find suitable land uh, and transmission connectivity, which can be a very long time gestation act, uh, process in India. Cost-wise, there's not much difference between them, uh, or except that uh, in open access, currently the state governments are providing a lot of incentives. Uh, on grid user charges and the, and when these grid user charge exemptions are being withdrawn, uh, there is a risk that cost of open access power will increase over the next few years. Uh, finally, as I said, uh, the distribution companies, uh, uh, they, they make, uh, they charge CNA consumers higher tariffs. So they are uh, in effect opposed uh, to the growth of these two options. So there is a little bit of resistance from them, uh, some adverse policy changes coming through uh, which need to be uh, navigated and managed carefully. Uh, from the government's perspective, the government is offering and trying to support this market, but then there are also various challenges. Uh, as I said, uh, there are uh, tax benefits in terms of accelerated depreciation, concessional uh, GST or the VAT rate. Uh, there is concessional debt financing uh, for rooftop solar for CNI consumers. Uh, Net metering connection is free right now in almost all parts of the country, uh, but there is a risk that uh, more grid user charges will be imposed in future. Uh, and finally, on open access, uh, while open access is allowed for consumers all over the country uh, above a certain size threshold, uh, what we are increasingly seeing is that the discoms are denying approvals uh, and changing very frequently the charges uh, applicable for this part. So that is a source of uh, growing pain or a policy uh, resistance for the market. Uh, now, there are two business models, uh, whether it is rooftop or open access, uh, in terms of whether consumers can basically finance the system and own the system themselves under the CapEx model, or they can sign a PPA with a third party developer under the OPEX model. So, the OPEX model is the overwhelming favorite right now. Uh, because consumers can conserve their capital and outsource all the responsibilities. Uh, but then uh, there is the requirement to sign a long-term PPA. So there is a bit of uh, commitment required to, to avail these benefits. Uh, I, I'm just uh, trying to wrap up the presentation quickly. Uh, there is uh, a very thriving uh, ecosystem, very mature, large institutional players uh, very well capitalized, lots of capital from oil and gas companies, utilities, uh, private equity funds coming into the CNI market. Uh, and really, uh, it is extremely competitive. So whether you want to go for the CapEx or the OPEX model, you have a large uh, number of suppliers to choose from. The use of storage uh, is still very limited, uh, mainly because uh, storage costs are deemed still to be quite high. 
uh, and the business models while they're visible, uh, but still uh, not proven. So we do believe that a uh, storage market, while it is small right now, it will uh, start growing in India over the next two to three years uh, and does uh, in fact hold huge potential uh, given the, the long-term trajectory of Indian power uh, in the country. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, you know, we see uh, renewable power procurement uh, market uh, uh, as a very attractive market, uh, huge growth potential, a uh, lot of uh, pull uh, both from the customers as well as from the investors. Uh, power markets in India are getting uh, liberalized slowly, new trading windows opening up, regulations uh, allowing uh, third-party purchase of power directly uh, from producers and developers. Uh, as I said, there's a huge investment interest in a thriving ecosystem. Uh, and I guess the only challenge that we see is uh, the resistance from the utilities. And it is something that remains uh, a, focus of it, a focus area for the government. And we do believe that the government is keen to support uh, this market. And eventually uh, some of the resistance will find uh, a, a, we will find a stable policy framework uh, for the growth of this market. Uh, that is the end of my presentation, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to take Q&A later on. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, uh, Vinay, I'm always impressed uh, how clear and crisp your information is uh, being brought to us. So. I really hope that a lot of uh, German, but also uh, Indian uh, industrial and commercial customers uh, got some new insights and uh, will dig deeper into the topic. Uh, uh, one company and one person which uh, did already dig uh, very much deeper into the topic is uh, Sri Sanjay Gariji. He is the Vice President uh, Sustainability, Safety and Environment and also on the Board of Directors of Skoda Auto Volkswagen Limited India. Uh, we are very delighted to have you here, uh, Mr. Sanjay Kariji, and uh, yes, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Harit Tobias. So, uh, will my video be played? Because that video was important to be played. Uh, when are we going to play the video of mine? Yeah, we, the video has been already shared and uh, a lot of people already gave positive comments on okay. uh, the so, video. So, we so had the video at the very beginning. Yeah. So, it was not on this group, so I was <laughs> waiting. So, no <laughs> problems. So, good. So, uh, Thank you all. I think uh, you can put my presentation on right now. Uh, can my presentation be there? Sahil, can you put on my presentation on? So, so, yes, it's showing. so we come to the next slide now. So Volkswagen Group, very, very, very brief introduction. We have got 13 major brands, Volkswagen, Skoda, Audi, Lamborghini, and Porsche. Five of which are there very, very prominently, prominently present in India. Volkswagen, Skoda, and Audi, they are manufactured here, and Porsche and Lamborghini are marketed. Mahan and Ducati also are present in certain formats over here. Scania is also format, uh, present in a different format. But the entity that I belong to, Volkswagen, Skoda, Volkswagen, India Private Limited, is into manufacture and sales of these five brands. Volkswagen, Skoda, Audi, manufacturing and Lamborghini Porsche sales also. So next slide, please. So it's already a more than 10 years old entity in uh, as far as uh, Volkswagen plant of Pune was concerned and more than 16 years was about uh, for the uh, Skoda plant that was in Aurangabad. So this Pune plant has already done 1 million uh, cars production operation and that's what we celebrated last year in Pune. So this is just to show that about the scale of operations that we have in India and the commitment that uh, the European major had towards the Indian markets and Indian capability building. Uh, next plate, please. So go to zero is the mission statement environment of Skoda Auto and also Volkswagen Group. And this all is very, very strong commitment to the two degrees integrate uh, uh, commitment towards the Paris Climate Agreement that we all are a party to. And we want to be totally carbon, absolutely carbon neutral across the entire life cycle of our vehicles by 2050. But that is across the entire part of uh, uh, upstream and downstream supply chain, the product, the production, as well as recycling. So my major focus area to talk about today is about production. So production is about, if you see the second column here is about called green factory, where we are focused upon making our 
plant and operations absolutely carbon neutral. Can please come to the next slide? So this is just a part of it. You can see the green product, green factory, and green detail, the three areas that we are working upon. And if you see bottom, we have got four goals, decarbonization index, uh, BEV share, how we want to bring the BEV share in. The, this right now, more focus is towards the Europe, towards US and China markets. And slowly and slowly, it certainly will pick up in the India region also, uh, depending upon the policy guidelines and the uh, regulatory framework and other infrastructure availability. Resources is a major function where we have been working for the last more than 10 years now. The UEP is a German word, which basically talks about the share of five resources, that is energy, CO2, uh, solid waste, water, and VOCs, volatile organic compound. And we have got our very own, very structured and very strong internal compliance management system towards um, environment. Uh, so it goes into the grassroots and each and every corner of the organization that we are very committed to the environmental compliances. Next slide, please. So these are two major goals that we are working upon. One we have already achieved. Our uh, Both the Pune plant and Oranga plant are now certified for a zero waste to landfill. So we are more than 98.99% certified, uh, no waste that goes to the landfill. And whatever 1% is left, that's also a challenge area, which we are working very hard. And we hope to also overcome that problem. So by next year, we target that we should be absolutely zero waste to landfill. And the next goal that we have taken is only for 2025, not for a much later time, that by 2025, we should be totally carbon neutral in our production areas. That is basically scope one and scope two. Oh, next page, please. So we did analyze our energy mix. If you can see the bottom curve that you, bottom that pie chart, we see that we have got a mix of our electrical uh, uh, requirements, then CNG that we use for our basically heating purposes in our paint shops. And then we have got our vehicles, which we are operating, uh, which are basically running on diesel, so on petrol. So how do we really target towards becoming absolute zero by 2025. That's what is the goal that we are working upon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, as uh, Mr. Rustagi already pointed out in this presentation that India certainly has got a lot of potential and it has got a lot of uh, cost economics built up into it. So India certainly is so abundant with solar energy all over, which is I mean, available literally free, whether you go to any part of the country. I mean, absolutely, I mean, you can see that, I mean, just, just one six month of August to December, we got substantial amount of uh, uh, solar concentration available to us, which we can tap and harness and use, and we can bring down our overall level. So we work down the two pronged approach of that. We work on any energy efficiency in our plants that whatever operations we do, whatever heat, whatever energy we can recover, whatever level of, uh, from conventional tube lights to going to LED based systems and all of our energy efficient devices, that everybody that we have got a whole set of ambassadors within the plant working, green future ambassadors, who are doing continuously improvements in their respective areas to reduce the emissions by reducing the uh, consumption itself. Without, uh, so we are focusing, focused by monitoring the electricity consumption per car. Uh, next slide, please. So we also said that what is the right way to really address the GHG emission uh, in the solar energy and what type of energy mix we can get best out of it. And we found that one of the worst methods is just in the present circumstances, whatever rooftops we had available, we could go up to 15% of our energy mix requirement by solar energy. So this was one study that we did way back in 2018. Uh, next slide, please. And same way we could find that how much of CO2 emissions we can save upon that, up to a maximum of 22% CO2 emissions we could save as far as the, um, uh, this thing, uh, GAG emissions were concerned. Next slide. And so if you see in our plants, uh, we have covered the almost the entire space of our body shop and assembly shop areas with an eight and a half megawatt rooftop solar plant. And with this plant, we came to our first level, which of our targets. Now we are already in the process of installing another 20, I mean, another 10 megawatts of rooftop solar, which we can see in the upper uh, right side, 2021. 2023, 24, again, we are progressing and uh, towards either we go in for PPA agreements uh, to buy energy from outside or we generate on our own. Because uh, generating on our own means, yes, we have got our benefits, but it's got a problem also that we waste upon our very, I mean, very, very precious is uh, uh, industrial 
uh, space also. So we are now toying with the future ideas about how to go in for the energy, right energy mix, what we buy or what we produce ourselves. Uh, next slide. So this is the present plan that we are having and the type of coverage we are doing. And fortunately, uh, uh, we are now having a very, very, very ambitious expansion plan. We are coming up with the new models next year, 2021, mid of next year. And already we have got the new plants ready. We can see the more rooftop spaces are ready. And we are going to fill up that also with the rooftop solar that is another 10 megawatts. So the present plant already has got to some 25,770 root solar cells, the rooftop area of 63,000 square meter was covered. We are able to generate 12.2 million units per year, equivalent to almost 10,200 10, number of households. And we are saving more than 9,050 tons of uh, carbon dioxide every year. This is almost 15% of our yearly power consumption. Uh, next slide. So this is how we celebrated. So we have got our top management from India as well as from Czech Republic, who are all together to see the first car which was produced with the green energy. So we are all there in the assembly line. This was the first car which moved out of the assembly line with the absolute green energy. So it's quite a rapid. Uh, next page. So if we see that uh, as far as the energy economics is concerned, what already Mr. Sugi said that yes, it's very, very beneficial as long as we are having our own rooftop, captive rooftop. It's not really captive, it's there in our plant. So we tied up with the uh, third party amp solar. So for them also the major benefit was that they are getting a free space and on the top of our roof. And for us that roof tape was otherwise lying idle. So that's where the major uh, benefit comes out that we are able to generate something at which is a fraction of the cost of what we're buying. So suppose in terms of rupees, uh, eight rupee 20 paisa or eight rupee 50 paisa that approximate cost comes if I buying from the DISCOM, which is a basically state uh, government agency. And if I'm generating on my own rooftop, the cost comes down drastically to around 3 rupees 60 paisa. There's a huge amount of cost economics involved. We always say that good sustainability is good for the business too. Uh, next page. So that's what we have said that there's the very quantum reduction in electrical bills. And already mentioned in Mr. Rusagi's presentation that uh, when we are going for an OPEX model, we are not really blocking our own money for investments and we are Mostly all the operational matters, all the operational risks are belonging to the uh, supplier, the PP agreement supplier who has put the rooftop on our, but yes, we have gone in for 25 year agreement and we expect that we shall be here for 25 years. We are very, very committed to Indian market and we want to be um, a good leader over here also. And yes, there's a very good CO2 reduction initiatives which have come, next slide. So again, it's a very specific presentation that 16% reduction in CO2 by the solar part, which we have got. Next page. Uh, same effective utilization of rooftop space. We are in, I mean, uh, injecting this energy into our in, internal 24 kV transformer, which goes to in the entire part of the plants. You can see the huge space that we have covered on the rooftop. It's really picturesque and really beautiful to see this uh, scenery. It's a beautiful plant with wonderful full of biodiversity and full of greenery. Uh, next page. So what are the further hurdles that we are expected to overcome? Very first hurdle that we found was that the mindsets, whether mindset internally or externally. And that was the first thing to break in the people's mind that yes, it's possible to do. And that's the first thing we started with that. Then we came about how, what business model to really adapt. First was that once the commitment came from top down and then bottoms of involvement happened, then many soft and hard issues were tackled. And we came to this business model of an OPEX. Now, next one is that certainly what we just now talked about that, yes, we have got a weekend power, which we are not really able to utilize properly. Uh, so how to really utilize that, whether we uh, get into a battery model or energy storage solutions we are working upon, but still, even though we are not able to utilize the weekend power in totality, it still is a much more financially viable option. Uh, future regulations and what is the make by optim optimizations we'll do is also a challenge we'll work upon. The ultimate goal is by 2025, latest all our I mean, energy, uh, whether it's from the electricity or whether if it's from the CNG gas, we should be able to convert to a, uh, convert to it absolutely green energy, whether we, we also toying with the idea of putting a biogas plant for our kind of captive purposes, also expanding our rooftop solar and maybe have some more PPS we'll do. But yes, we'll achieve this goal of 2025 totally carbon neutral. Uh, next slide. 
that's all. So this is a brief summary of what we have done in energy conservation, waste and sea reduction and CO2 reduction. We are already a zero liquid discharge facility and more than 97%, 98% of our solid waste is totally recycled and measures are underway to be a zero waste factory. And we already talked a lot about the energy conservation and the zero CO2 initiatives. Uh, that was my brief about it and we are really very, very committed and we want to be a contributor to a very clean green world with our sustainable mobility solutions. Thank you. Any questions I'd like to take in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Kariji. That was very, very impressive. Uh, bahut, bahut acha, I must say. And uh, I hope and I'm actually convinced that uh, a lot of companies now having watched your presentations uh, will see this as uh, an, as an uh, Kickstarter for their own uh, thought process, as you have uh, mentioned. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, looking definitely forward to further discuss with you at the end of the discussion round uh, about this process and uh, OPEX module chosen. Thank you very much. And with this, uh, we will continue uh, with uh, Mr. Subramaniam. He is the vice president of Anna Park Energy Private Limited. And he'll give us some insights uh, with on the ground experience from a German company with different business models implemented uh, for industrial and commercial customers in India. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Yeah. Namaste and guten tag. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, you can see my presentation, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, I'd uh, uh, speak a bit about Enapark uh, briefly, like about a minute or two, and then I'd take you through a few examples of uh, solar photovoltaic solutions that we had implemented for commercial and industrial customers. Uh, I'd also speak a little bit about the uh, process of uh, guiding a customer or any commercial and industrial uh, consumer through the uh, you know, uh, uh, process of selecting what kind of a uh, renewable power mix or what kind of a solar power solution should they be adopting. Then I talk about a few challenges that currently developers as well as EPC players are facing in the market. And then I would uh, talk about a case in point of one particular project, just as Mr. Khari spoke about his own plant. Um, so with that, I just uh, brief you a bit about Enapark. Enapark, uh, we are a global expert in uh, uh, solar power solutions. We have close to three gigawatts of projects uh, that are done as a general contractor. And uh, out of these about two gigawatts are our own investments, uh, projects that are done for the government as well as projects that are done for industrial and commercial customers. And uh, these two gigawatts are spread over 455 plus solar projects across the world. Uh, and uh, among us, these uh, projects that we had built, uh, we are operating about 2.2 gigawatts. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, what I would like to highlight here is that we are a strong believer in the product that we actually sell and we only and only do solar power uh, solutions. So close to two gigawatts of our own investment is a testament for that. So. Uh, we are headquartered in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, other than Germany, the only other office where we have full service provide, I mean, uh, solutions provide, provided are from Bangalore. Uh, here we have a complete engineering team as well as a procurement team and a construction team. So we serve the three disciplines all from India. Uh, also, we take care of a few markets in Southeast Asia as well as Middle East from India. So. Uh, we rank number one in Europe, given the scale of investment as well as the number of projects that we had done. Rank number seven uh, in the world uh, as an EPC company uh, for solar power uh, plants. Uh, the company as such is founded in 2008 uh, by three individuals uh, and uh, the headquarters is in Germany and it's completely privately held. Uh, it's, there is no third party investment as such into the company, it is 
held by the three individuals and uh, uh, as such there is no unlike many other renewable power developers or investors in india uh, we do investments in india but we are entirely privately held uh, so this is our global footprint uh, as you can see a considerable part of it is in europe uh, in india we are close to about 160 megawatts of projects that are done and about close to 10 megawatts of investments that we had done on uh, in mul on multiple commercial and industrial uh, projects and uh, out of the 160 that we had actually built we are operating close to 50 megawatts of these plants uh, the us operations has been recently divested uh, to the toy maker company lego uh, to offset their carbon footprint due to the uh, you know uses of plastic in producing the toys and we are still helping them out in the transition uh in park in india is a 100% subsidiary of enapark germany we are established in jan 2015 that's about 5 years after we have been established in germany uh headquartered in bangalore uh, most of our team here has been uh, in solar for a considerable long period of time. Uh, uh, if you look at the solar journey, India had gone through a remarkable transition in the last 10 years. Uh, but our managing director, Mr. Santosh, has been in solar for close to 20 years, uh, starting up uh, uh, by setting up the uh, technology division for Tata BP Solar in India and uh, many of our team members here have been uh, in the solar industry from the times of Tata BP Solar, close to about 20 years now. And uh, that way, we uh, have seen solar go through many phases in India, from being a very, very, very early adopter to almost a mass adoption moment that we are seeing right now. It's still not there, but I think we are somewhere close to that. So we offer. Uh, these three kinds of solutions. Uh, we do EPC, engineering procurement construction, for rooftop and ground mounted projects in the CNI segment, as well as we do uh, mid to large scale uh, balance of system works for uh, large developers for ground mount projects. And we do invest in rooftop and ground mount projects for commercial and industrial customers. And uh, we also undertake operation and maintenance of already existing constructed projects by any other developer or EPC player or including that of ours as well. Yeah. So I'd uh, take a minute to talk about our presence across the country. As you can see, we are present from all the way uh, in Haryana in the north till about Coimbatore in the south, as well as from uh, Ahmedabad uh, in the west to Assam uh, in the east. So we perhaps spanned across the country with multiple projects. One of the recent projects is about a 35 megawatt solar power plant, which we had commissioned in Assam. Uh, and uh, so uh, truly when we say uh, we have a pan-India presence, we mean it and we had done it as well. Uh, now, a few marquee projects on the right side, uh, you'd see we had done the first solar power plant uh, about uh, 150 meters away from an active runway. So. Uh, this is one of our uh, 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 you know, marquee projects. We had uh, installed a two megawatts uh, uh, first, and then we had increased the capacity by another five megawatts in the Delhi International Airport. So close to seven megawatts of solar power plants in the Delhi International Airport have been installed by us right next to an active runway. In fact, uh, we have also relocated uh, uh, about uh, five megawatts of these solar power plants from one location to another location, saving the modules and considerable part of the infrastructure that is already invested by the GMR uh, international airports. So uh, it is not just building a solar power plant, but perhaps even going ahead and relocating it from one location to another uh, is, is a thing that we had done and perhaps first of its kind again uh, you know, in India. So one is building it right next to an active runway, and then again, relocating it when the runway was to be extended from one location to another, and all within the premises of an airport, uh, and within short timelines have been done by us. Uh, the next project actually is a, a project mounted on a ship to shore crane uh, in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust. 
uh, these cranes actually vibrate quite a lot when they actually when they're uh, in operation, and hence we had used here, uh, you know, copper, uh, indium, gallium, selenide modules, and or what we in general terms call as thin film modules, so that uh, the vibration is not going to crack the glass up and the cells. So this is a one of its kind of installation that is done off coast Mumbai uh, in the JNPT port uh, for uh, APM terminals, the Norwegian company, and uh, we are in fact uh, they're a key account for us, and we are doing uh, one more project for them in Gujarat very soon, and that too in very challenging conditions uh, on the coast. Uh, as I was explaining you, we've done the world's first solar relocation project on an active airport, moving a five megawatt solar power plant, uh, you know, over a 20 acre area from one location to another uh, in an active airport. Also, uh, the Hyderabad International Airport has 10 megawatts of solar power plants uh, that are built by Anna Park and operated by us. A considerable part of the airport actually runs on Anna Park solar power plants. Uh, so this gives you an idea about commercial installations. In fact, the airports and uh, uh, you know ports are by themselves commercial uh, examples, unlike the industrial examples that uh, you had heard from Mr. Khare. Uh, while uh, commercial is something that not usually heard of or is usually heard of in a very small context of retail stores and so on and so forth, but uh, uh, this is a different scale of commercial solar power adoption that we had done quite successfully in India. Um, uh, these are a few of our uh, clients and who had been repeat customers. Uh, you would see uh, many German uh, you know, companies as well, Kluber Lubrication, Nivea, Dimash as a company and so on and so forth. So we are also building a four megawatt solar power plant for Reliance in Silvasa. Uh, uh, then uh, Saint Gobain, the French glass company, is a key account. We have done close to about four megawatts of solar power plants, and and currently we are constructing about uh, uh, three and a half megawatts of solar power plants on their roof as our own investments. Uh, uh, Triton Walls, uh, automotive company, automotive automotive company, is a customer. Kohler, the bathtub company. So, as you can see, we had helped many of these customers not just in understanding uh, the uh, benefits of solar, but help them through the cycle of uh, identifying which solution is good for them, whether they would, is it, is it advantageous for them to actually invest uh, by themselves, or is it good for us to actually go ahead and invest? That choice many a times is the last one that we address. Uh, we actually first address the need for solar, uh, you know, I mean, of course, the need is amply clear, but then we define the need and we make them understand what percentage of it can actually be catered through solar, uh, both on-site, off-site. And then uh, we go ahead and guide them through the process of selecting what kind of a solution would they want. Uh, either they, they, they're, they're open to doing a uh, you know, captive solar power plant or they are even open to actually procure it from an open access kind of a model. And then we go ahead and actually take the, I mean, help them take the decision on a CapEx or an OpEx. And I mean, this has happened with multiple clients and usually uh, it's a six month to one year process in any, uh, for any commercial or industrial customer to understand the need and then make a decision. And it may even go beyond a year, but all through this process, uh, we guide the customer, we actually handhold them through this process. And most of these customers have actually given us repeat projects and that uh, indicates their, uh, the, the, the proof of the pudding. Um, then a uh, few references. This is 1.25 megawatts project for Avery Denison in uh, Pune, uh, Maharashtra, uh, and two megawatts for uh, St. Gobain Glass in Gujarat uh, uh, to the right side. Uh, 980 kilowatts for uh, Bharat Friswarna uh, in uh, Karnataka, uh, it's our own investment, and uh, the 7.9 megawatts Delhi International Airport that I spoke about, and the 10 megawatts uh, Hyderabad International Airport, uh, where the airport, uh, you know, to a considerable extent is run on our solar power plants. Uh, th these are a few references, but uh, I uh, kept the references brief, and I'd. Uh, 
like to highlight a little bit about the aspects uh, that are very key to actually making a, a decision to go solar and the challenges while uh, Mr. Vinay has actually highlighted many of them uh, in, in good amount of detail. I just touch upon them briefly. So many a times customers have this expectation, you know, and the primary expectation being savings that coming from that, that come from the solar power. And of course, another main uh, expectation is uh, the sustainability goals and, you know, carbon neutral goals or, uh, you know, uh, the, the customer by himself could be a part of the, have this RE100 goal that they would like to achieve by a certain timeline. So uh, we understand the need first, uh, we define it well, uh, then once we understand the why part of it as to whether the savings is a primary motive or a RE100 goal is the primary motive or an RPO obligation is the primary motive, the solutions can differ. Uh, the speed at which we execute the solutions can differ and the scale at which we execute the solution can differ. So uh, once we understand the first step, then we go ahead and analyze how to ad help them adopt to the uh, uh, you know, renewable power, solar power in their current business circumstance. So whether it needs to be done on site or off site, in fact, many customers who are on the commercial side, uh, for example, commercial establishment, office spaces, malls, they may not have, uh, you know, uh, a rooftop space available to actually set up a solar power plant on their roofs and they would like to go for an off site solution where they may procure power through an open access uh, route. Uh, uh, and on site, which is largely prevalent among industrial customers and a few commercial customers uh, has already been talked about. So that's one decision that we help them make. And to what extent, you know, sometimes we hear customers saying, hey, we don't want to uh, take power from the grid and uh, we just want to run completely on solar. And that's not going to happen so easily and no fast so there is there's is time uh, uh, you know there's at least another five ten years before we reach to that stage where storage becomes really affordable so uh, we also try to clear many of these these misconceptions uh, or rather i would say uh, well-intentioned thoughts but then perhaps not achievable in the current scenario so we try to actually work with them make them understand what works what doesn't work uh, whether a captive solar power plant will work for them or an open access and really the last question as i was telling is whether it will be their own investment or they expend or i mean whether it will be our own investment from enerpark end or investment from the client side so uh, this is a question which we address the last once we define the need and how to achieve it and whether in what mode it has to be achieved so uh, uh, we had helped many customers adopt the solutions maybe with another industry competitor but we help them go through the journey of identifying what suits them best so in a sense we evangelize solar i mean it doesn't really matter who does it but at the end of it helping people adopt to solar is a goal that we always work towards and uh, the fourth thing is the transparency on what can be and what cannot be see solar power is largely dependent on sunlight you know at the end of it uh, it isn't quite predictable as people would expect it to be, right? I mean, uh, uh, there are many things that, uh, you know, come in between us and the sun. So, I mean, it could be environment, it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dust conditions, particularly in industrial and in industrial environments and rains that are not quite well predicted. The meteorological information in India is not to the point always. So uh, while that said, we are also moving in the right direction where you know green energy is getting traded on exchanges. So uh, as the industry adopts solar more and more, uh, the predictability aspect of it will grow. But given what it is today and what it is perhaps across the world, the aspect of predictability is a bit of a question. And uh, while we make, uh, we don't make tall claims, we make the customer understand this is possible and this isn't. The next aspect which Vinay spoke in a bit of a detail about is policy and policy keeps changing quite a lot, particularly with respect to uh, renewable power because renewable power is always viewed as a competition and particularly third party renewable power is viewed as a competition by the distribution and the generation companies that are state owned, which have been in losses due to many other reasons due to uh, lack of metering at an agricultural uh, utilization or due to lack of uh, you know uh, 
uh, and, uh, control in losses due to the transmission issues. So as when I was already telling this, this is just 1% of the uh, consumption is right now catered by rooftop solar. But the amount of flip-flops that the government has taken with, uh, many state governments have taken with respect to the policy over the last couple of years uh, from restraining operate, OPEC uh, investments in Karnataka to, you know, uh, many other things that have happened in other states. Uh, we had seen uh, uh, solar power and uh, rooftop solar being considered as a threat in by many state uh, distribution companies. And that actually goes in loggerheads with the center's policy where they're actually planning to put smart meters uh, and giving the choice of, uh, you know, uh, power to the customer. I mean, that's been talked about by the Honorable uh, uh, Finance Minister in the budget this year, that the government in the next couple of years will go towards a smart meter system where the choice of power will be given to the uh, customer who would be the end consumer. And uh, we usually give a solution that is also futuristic. So say, for example, you want to integrate storage in the future uh, with whatever is existing. We don't rule out that option. We also do the analysis for that, but we tell you this may not be adaptable today, but perhaps a couple of years down the line when storage becomes affordable. Challenges, as I had already touched upon, uh, the approach of some state governments is uh, not quite encouraging. Then the predictability of the meteorological data, environmental aspects, uh, particularly in industrial environments uh, where uh, the pollution is a big aspect as well as uh, dust accumulation on occasions is a very big aspect. And the last, perhaps the most important in the current context, there is a wide gap between the demand for solar power in the country to the capabilities uh, to actually cater to the market uh, in India per se. So today, 80% of solar, uh, you know, uh, equipment actually are imported straight forward and uh, uh, that, act, that 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 sort of uh, puts a question on to uh, whether uh, there will be a, a capability in india to cater to the demand i mean demand part of it is very clear over the last three months what we are facing even though there is covid uh, many industrial customers are adopting to solar but uh, the uh, the the original equipment manufacturer market has not been quite collaborative, of course, due to the ongoing border scenario, as well as many other policy related uh, issues that are there for imports, uh, as well as lack of uh, domestic capability uh, and capacity to manufacture and cater to the industry. So this uh, so, is Indian another thing. Please come to an end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is the last one. Uh, Tobias. Uh, so I'd uh, conclude this. This is a project which we had invested upon. Uh, though we have done investments which are bigger than this, I would like to uh, briefly talk about it because this is a project which adopts uh, solar on warehouses, RCC buildings, the ground area and the park parking locations. So we had provided a technical and financial solution that adopts solar in various forms in a, when, in a very small, uh, you know, uh, 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 place. So we, uh, that's pretty much what I had, and uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Subramaniam, uh, for uh, your insights. And uh, that actually gives us some more time to uh, discuss this very interesting uh, market segment. But first of all, what we learned is it's happening. It's happening. It's happening uh, uh, since a couple of years and it's still uh, uh, growing. But as Mr. Rushtagi mentioned, uh, Vinayji, there are certain risks no, uh, related, especially to the uh, grid connection. Um, maybe uh, you can detail a little bit more on these kind of aspects and uh, which business model would be actually uh, for, uh, uh, preferred to actually uh, uh, don't uh, yeah, relate to the risk as a client, no? Uh, thanks, Tobias. Uh, so, you know, what I meant was uh, whether uh, you are going for a rooftop solar system, which needs to be connected to the grid, uh, or an open access project, uh, off-site project, there are challenges in both the cases for connection to the grid. 
in an offsite projects, the challenge, in my view, is bigger because there is a bit of arbitrariness which is employed by the state level agencies in deciding how much time to take to give the approval, whether or not to give the approval, etc. Uh, and in the many states are currently giving no approvals whatsoever, despite the policy allowing these projects uh, to be implemented. Uh, in rooftop, uh, the challenge is slightly different. Uh, the policy framework is very clear, whether it be it will be a net metering or a cross metering connectivity. But the challenge here is that the policy itself is kind of changing a little bit. Uh, so we have seen uh, that some states which allow net metering, they are now discontinuing net metering. They are saying only uh, net metering for certain consumers, cross metering for everybody else. And then uh, even then, uh, the time which is taken to give net metering approvals is also going up. So these are kind of some of the various challenges which are being thrown up by the distribution companies to kind of uh, slightly slow down the growth in this market. Thank you, Vinayji. But uh, yeah, then maybe let me pass this uh, question also to uh, Mr. Kariji. You said you uh, were choosing the OPEX model. So uh, I assume the commercial risk for the units not consumed. Uh, lays uh, uh, with the uh, uh, company you closed your PPA with, no? So uh, your commitment is 25 years uh, and uh, their commitment is to uh, uh, fix these kind of issues in case. That's just my question to you because you mentioned that in the long term you are actually heading towards uh, 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 completely uh, self-consumption or captive uh, or at least as much as possible uh, via uh, usage of uh, battery technology. So yeah, very interesting uh, to hear a little bit more from your side on these kind of aspects. Mr. Kari? Uh, I was muted. Am I audible now? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So yes, we did foresee this problem and we had an option of whether to go in for 25 years or whether we to go in for 10 years. The time we go in for a 10 year agreement, the prices are not what we got. The prices were much more higher. Ultimately, it's all about investor is investing his money and he'll get his returns. This is what he has put his money in for. There's no, I mean, there's no free lunches anywhere. So uh, we certainly have our the legal agreements. We have made a clause for exit. In case we are stopping the operations and we have to exit, we have really taken care of the same things in our legal agreements. That in case we have to exit some reason, we have to exit. And uh, But we don't uh, foresee such a thing happening because we do have a lot of plans for the country and a lot of new possibilities are there in the new. And uh, because India is really a growing economy and we do a lot of hopes for this place where the uh, people in the young age brackets are going to be real consumers. So we do see a lot of things for the auto industry over here. Yeah, very interesting. So you're operating, operating 24 by 7, uh, also Saturday, uh, Sunday. So the solar is being consumed also uh, during the weekend time or uh, oh. your uh, PPA contract is uh, taking care of what to do with the uh, electricity on the weekend? No, oh, that's where the challenge lies. And I think I covered in my presentation also that weekend, whatever power is there, that is still remains to be utilized. We are expecting that we could be able to get some storage solutions. We are trying some other methodologies like inside, like, I mean, we are doing our own battery charging for our forklift, store trucks, uh, whatever we can do, shift of our operations on Saturdays and Sundays, we have shifted so that we can utilize this power in a better way. Uh, but this, yes, is a question to us, how to utilize this power in a more way, in a better way. But still, whatever uh, solution we had come up to, uh, it was much more economical, even if we are not able to utilize the power on the weekends as compared to the power purchase agreement. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for uh, pointing this out, uh, Mr. Kari. Uh, that uh, brings us actually back to Mr. Subramaniam. You said uh, your company is also willing to invest uh, uh, in these kind of roofs. So uh, uh, the first question uh, to you would be, uh, how do you handle uh, if you find a customer which is actually maybe not consuming electricity on weekend times? Is that a challenge for you because you have to sell this power uh, to the grid? Uh, but seems like you're doing it. And second question uh, would be, what's the minimum roof size I would need to have as an uh, industry or commercial customer for you to be interesting to have this kind of deal where I just pay for the electricity and do not need to participate in the investment? Mr. Sasabramanian. Hey, uh, so thanks, Rabia. So to 
answer your uh, first question, yes, we do face challenges with customers uh, who will not be consuming this. There's always a certain amount of deem generation that we allow for the customers to, you know, um, uh, uh, take off from the PPA, wherein the, the hit would be on our side. But uh, beyond a certain amount of deem generation, I mean, it varies, uh, of course, based on the tariff at which the customer is buying uh, the solar power, and it varies from customer to customer. So certain level of deem generation is allowed within the PPA. Uh, but yeah, uh, beyond a certain amount, uh, we would ask them to pay for the deem generation. Uh, and uh, we'd also show them transparently, even though if they pay for it, uh, either the tariff goes up or they pay for the unutilized generation that comes out. I mean, if net metering is not allowed in that particular state or if net metering possibility is exhausted, again, it differs. You know, Many customers have uh, you know, shutdowns happening, which are periodic. And if that is put in within the power purchase agreement, uh, we'd have to pay, take that hit. That has to be accounted for when we actually quote for the tariff. Or if it is a long-term customer, we may waive that over three or four plants that they want to want us to invest upon. So it's made to the customer's needs and uh, to the suitability of their uh, uh, you know, uh, particular uh, uh, plant. Yeah, but we do waive a reasonable bit of the deal generation that comes out, which they don't use. Yeah. Thank you. Second Next question, uh, when is battery coming in a big uh, manner to actually overcome this issue? Uh, I think uh, we are actually looking at maybe two years down the line uh, to three years. Best, I mean, worst case is what we're seeing. We have already requires requests from many customers wanting to actually adopt to storage, uh, even in a limited fashion. Uh, uh, but uh, whenever we look at it as an OPEX, it has still not reached that lay stage. The tariff almost doubles up from what it is currently. So uh, I think we are at least a couple of years down the line. I think Germany and other countries have been trying to invest uh, in storage for large scale projects. And uh, uh, I mean, as adoption starts towards the West and then travels towards the East. So uh, we are hoping perhaps in a couple of years, it'll uh, be there. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, this actually also, already brought us to an end, but uh, I, uh, I'm convinced, it's not that I hope, I'm convinced that uh, the insights given by you, uh, thank you, uh, Vineji, thank you to Dr. Kari, Mr. Supramanyam, these insights are very, very valuable, and uh, I'm very thankful to the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce for having given us the opportunity to present these kind of business cases. Uh, companies are doing it, Indian companies are doing it, German companies are doing it, more and more companies are doing it, uh, not only in India, actually all over the world. world. Uh, the trend is going towards uh, self-consumption uh, as high as possible. Uh, really wonderful to see how corporates are actually taking the energy transition in its own hands, fascinated uh, by what Skoda is aiming at and all, has already achieved. So uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for having participated in this. And uh, yes, Pirmilinge.